afternoon session of the Wiley Drake Show from beautiful Buena Park, California. We are roughly a mile and a half north of Knott's Berry Farm. <clears throat> this is going to be an interesting event because today the Congressional Committee on Benghazi has released their report, and it is different than what you think it would be. So if you have not gone on to social media or uh, some other way that you can get the true story of what the Benghazi report says, take a look at it. The question that didn't get answered, and I haven't been able to read the full report yet because it just got released, is somebody needs to explain to me how the office of the Secretary of State, which is a civilian position, had authority over the military that is the protecting force for the consulate in foreign countries. So somebody needs to explain to me if the military had a rescue team, and they talk about two different rescue teams that were ready to roll, why is it that the Secretary of State's office, and unfortunately this individual by the name of Hillary Clinton, had authority to tell the military to stand down? That seems to me like authority she did not have. And I was hoping that the report was going to explain that, but so far that hasn't come out yet. Maybe when uh, tomorrow, when the various talk shows such as um, the, uh, oh, my brain just went completely blank, Sean Hennedy, Rush Limbaugh, and um, Glenn Beck get to talk about it, they can explain that part of it. But I certainly don't think that they had the authority. I'm having been in the military for many years, I think if an order had come down from the Secretary of State telling me that I couldn't go rescue an ambassador in another country, I might have not so politely to tell them to put that order when the sun don't shine. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're live on the Wiley Drake Show, and we have a caller here from a dear friend of ours, Rudy Davis. Are you there, my brother? Yes, sir. I'm here. Hello, right. Rudy. Rudy, hello. God bless you, my friend. Uh, we've had a busy day today. We uh, talked earlier about uh, our case that we're going to be working on uh, with uh, Francis Schaefer Cox. We also talked about what the Supreme Court did. We had our attorney from San Antonio, Alan Parker, who has indeed filed uh, many cases in the Supreme Court and uh, this terrible decision that just occurred. And we're going to be talking about some other things. But ladies and gentlemen, one of the men that I met a number of years ago through my pastor, Dr. James David Manning, Dr. Manning said, I want you to meet this guy. Uh, he's in a battle. And he was battling for a man who at that time had been in prison for about eight years. Uh, and his name was Kent Hovine. And Dr. Manning said, we need to try to help this guy help get that man out of jail. And this guy was a man by the name of Rudy Davis and his dear wife Erin. Rudy, good afternoon, and God bless you. Well, God bless you, uh, Pastor Wiley Drake, and uh, uh, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm very grateful for your support and anybody that will uh, listen to Schaefer's story and, um, and just praise God. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I would encourage you to go to the website. And, uh, Brother Rudy, would you give them, if they want to find out more about the Francis Schaefer Cox, they're going to get tired of me talking about it, but at the same time, they can go to the web and verify what we're talking about. Would you give them uh, how they can find that, please? You bet. Uh, the website is www.freeshafer, and that's spelled S-C-H-A-E-F-F-E-R, freeshafercox.com, and uh, it has a lot of information there. And if you click on the YouTube button, we, we upload videos every single day uh, educating people about Schaefer Cox's case and the corruption in our uh, Department of Justice and within our, within our federal prosecutors. Ladies and gentlemen, here's a man that's in his early 30s, and he's already been in jail now, I think, about five years. Right, Rudy? Yes, sir. I, I, I think it's uh, going on six now. Oh, going on six now. And he has two children, one of which were, uh, is, uh, is just a baby, right? Uh, he went, they took, they took uh, him to prison about a few weeks after she was born. Okay. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, here is a man that uh, did no wrong. He committed no crime, and yet the United States government has put him in jail for over 25 years. 
we've got to do everything we can. And as I've said before, at the risk of being a conspiracy theory nut, I'm not. But ladies and gentlemen, I was a licensed private investigator in the state of Texas for more than five years. And so I do know a little bit about investigation. And when I heard about this story, I said, come on, that can't be true. He must have done something wrong. And I investigated. I had other investigators on it. And he's done nothing wrong except speak out against the government. And he's done no uh, nothing to break the law. And yet he's in a solitary, confined, special prison because he dares challenge uh, the United States government. We've got to get this man out of jail for his benefit and the benefit of his two children and his dear wife. And I want to uh, say one thing, and I want to ask, I'm going to give, uh, I know, Rudy, you've got a million things to do, but uh, uh, this man's name is uh, Francis Schaefer Cox. And, uh, Rudy, you know the family and you know some of the friends. I would like to know what the story is behind that name. I'm old enough to remember that Francis Schaefer was a mighty man of God, a warrior that spoke out against all of these things. And uh, he was a great man of God. He's in heaven now. But I have a sneaky suspicion that if you'll investigate for us, you'll probably find that the father, who is also a Baptist preacher, by the way, I might throw in there just for fun, he is a Southern Baptist preacher. <laughs> and uh, I have a strange hunch that uh, uh, Mr. Cox and Mrs. Cox uh, had a great deal of appreciation for Francis Schaefer. Therefore, they named their son Francis Schaefer Cox. You find out about that for me, I'd appreciate it. You bet, Wiley. You're absolutely right. And uh, there's a book written, uh, Francis August Schaefer, How Then Should We Live? And uh, I have no doubt that they named him after that man there. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, Brother Rudy, what else would you like to share with us by way of prayer request, praise report, anything you'd like to share? You're live on the air on the Wiley Drake Show on the Congressional Prayer Conference live around the world. Go ahead. All right. No, thank, thank you, Pastor Wally Drake. And I, let me just quickly uh, say that, as you said earlier, when I first heard about this case, uh, which was probably three to four months ago, the first question I asked myself is, why haven't I heard about this case before? Hmm. Because it just, it's, it's so horrific, you know, how it's described, that he's a completely innocent man. And I started to listen to the man. There's, a, there's about an hour and 41-minute speech where Schaefer Cox gives a rousing speech about liberty and our, our biblical uh, foundations that this country was founded upon. And it's, a, it's an excellent speech, and I would recommend everybody listen to it. But just like you, Pastor Wally Drake, when I first got involved, I said, man, this, there's something weird about this. He must have done something wrong. Mm -hmm. And I've read 17 days of trial transcripts. I've read over 500 pages of a book called License to Lie by Sidney Powell, exposing corruption, uh, exposing corruption in the Department of Justice. I've read literally thousands of papers. Every single day, I've become, I've become, it's, 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 it's consumed all of my spare time. And the more I investigate this case, the more and more I'm convinced that he did absolutely nothing wrong. He was targeted by a corrupt group within the a Department of Justice called the Polar Pen Investigation Team. They're the same group of corrupt pro federal prosecutors that went after Senator Ted Stevens. And just in case your audience wasn't aware, Senator Ted Stevens was the longest-running United States Senator in American history. He, he, it's like 40-something years he had been a senator. He was going for a re-election, and he was, he was uh, expected to win. But the Polar Pen investigation team went after him and said that he was uh, doing corrupt business deals. It was all a farce. It was all a, it was all a made up. There was nothing to any of those charges, but it caused him to lose his re-election. When he lost that re-election in Alaska, uh, that paved the way for Democrats to take control, and now we have Obamacare. It, it, it's very likely that if he had not have lost his race, Senator Ted Stevens, that we would not have Obamacare today. The reason this is important is the same group, there was a judge, Judge Emmett G. Sullivan in Alaska, and he saw when this thing finally came to life, and he ordered a special prosecution of this polar pin investigation team with the Department of Justice. And after he ordered that investigation, uh, they were exposed for all of the evil that they were doing. I mean, they were they were basically uh, not giving uh, fair trials to participants, particularly T Senator Ted Stevens, 
but they had a whole slew of others that they had uh, done Ill- unethically and illegally as well. Schaefer Cox was part of that group of people that they had targeted and railroaded into prison. Mm. And so I just wanted to say, uh, Pastor Wally Drake, that now that we know about this, we're not going to shut up. We're going to expose this, and we're not going to back down. And the Lord says, just as in Gideon's army, if anybody has fear, the Lord says, send them back. Yep. But we're going to speak the truth on this. We, we, we got all the ammo. We know, we know the names of the people involved. And we are going to shout from the rooftops until they let our brother out of that prison. Because I am convinced within my heart of hearts, just as you said earlier, he didn't do anything wrong. The yeah. only thing he did wrong was he spoke the truth. Amen. Well, and of course we know that uh, our good friend Kent Hovine did the same thing, ended up 10 years in jail before the Lord, using you and me and a few other people, the Lord did it though, and I want to preface Amen. that, that the Lord did it, but he, but the Lord always uses people. He always Amen. uses people, and uh, we need to be used to the Lord, and that's why that we're involved in this fight. Now, uh, my campaign manager, uh, Mary Margaret Steele uh, has a question. Go ahead, Mary Margaret. My question is, with all this publicity, and you said we're going to keep talking, we're going to keep getting promotion out there um, for Schaefer Cox, my issue is, is that a safe thing for him? Because he's the one in solitary confinement. He's the one in prison. How, how do we balance doing what we're doing to raise the funds and awareness That's a very good question, and uh, the only thing I can think of, and I'm sorry I didn't get your name, did you mind, was it Mary? Mary Margaret Steele, and she's the campaign manager for the Wiley Drake presidential campaign. Very good, very good. I, I think, I think uh, we all, I need counsel on that, Mary, because uh, I want to, from my nature, is to scream from the rooftops about the injustices that have gone on, and the name names, and the... Uh, uh, raise awareness on this, because I'll, I'll say that there are people in Alaska, when I speak to those people, they've known about Schaefer for the past five years. He's a very common and well-known name in Alaska. But down here in Texas, nobody even knew about him up, up until about a month ago. And a lot of people in Texas still don't know about him. Yeah. So it depends on what part of the country, whether people know about him or not. But um, my nature is, Mary, just to scream as loud as I can and yell the truth and not to be fearful and to trust in the Lord. But if there's if there's some thinking that that is not necessarily the best course of action because uh, Schaefer is a captive of the enemy, uh, I'm open. I'm open because I certainly don't want to do anything that endangers Schaefer. But at the same time, we've got to speak the truth and we've got to let people know what's going on in this country because I believe Schaefer's not the only one that's been targeted. I believe that there's others as well. Well, you're absolutely right. And, and uh, we all want to be as careful as we know how. And uh, Rudy knows me well enough to know that, that I've got sort of a big mouth, too. But uh, my, my, my mother prophesied about it, and my God told me to do it. So I'm going to be as careful and as cautious as I can. But I'm not going to back up. I'm not going to shut up. I'm going to keep on going to help get these people out of jail that are in there falsely, men and women. And, of course, that's what we're fighting about. We were on the telephone just a few moments ago with an attorney here in California uh, that has kept some people out of jail and so forth and gotten their children back and so forth. Now, at that time, though, we're going to do, and Mary Margaret is not only my campaign manager, but she's a deputy prayer warrior for the Congressional Prayer Conference of Washington, D.C. She has already been praying for you and, and for uh, the Cox family. I had the privilege, as I said, to talk with uh, Mr. Cox's dad, on the phone, and we're praying with them and praying for them. And we don't want to do anything that would be detrimental. But, folks, when you get into battle, uh, you know, it gets the tough gets going, and that's when the, the tough have to get going, and we're going to keep doing everything we possibly can. A little later, we're going to be talking to you uh, about a more practical matter, and that is, uh, as you can imagine, here's a young father that hasn't seen his children uh, at all hardly. They don't allow him visits and so forth, and uh, they do allow a very few, but uh, the problem is, is that he, where does he, he, live, he still lives in Alaska? Is that where he lives? Well, uh, he's, uh, his family is in Alaska. I think they're close to Anchorage, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, either Anchorage or Fairbanks, but uh, mm. I, of course, uh, of course uh, he's in Marion, Illinois prison, and yeah. uh, 
Yeah, the federal prison. So the point is, ladies and gentlemen, somewhere along the line, we, if we're going to help, uh, we may shout and we may talk and we may name names and, and as, as Rudy would say, we're going to turn the light on and make noise. But sometimes you have to put feet to your prayers and we're going to have to figure out a way that we can get that dear mother and her children uh, from Alaska uh, all the way to Marion, Illinois. That's where he's in prison. And so we can get them there so they'll he'll be able to visit with his children. So we'll talk more about that later. But that's the goal. That's what we're going to have to do. And, folks, when you, when you sign on to these things, you not only sign on to be a prayer warrior, but you sign on uh, to be a, a financer, if you will. And so we're going to be asking people. Uh, my understanding is it's going to cost about three grand uh, to get him and, I mean, his wife and two kids there and so forth. And, uh, but, you know, that, uh, that's nothing. Uh, if you really think about it, if, if, ever, if, if a few people would give a few dollars, we could raise that, and we'll be talking more about that later. But in the meantime, we can put feet to our prayers. We're prayer on the ground. We're boots on the ground at the Congressional Prayer Conference in California. Uh, Rudy and his dear wife Erin are prayer in the air right now, and they're boots on the ground in Texas. So we want you all to be boots on the ground, prayer in the air. And uh, uh, give that website one more time, Rudy, and any other information you'd like to give to the folks in reference to you or anything else. You bet. No, thank you very much, Pastor Drake. And uh, I'll, just, I'll just quickly say that in the Bible, many, many times, uh, in reference to Mary's question about, you know, how, how should we best help Schaefer, uh, the Bible talks about they feared the people. Yeah. The, the people that the, tyrann the tyrannical... People in charge that have gone after liberty-minded and biblically-minded people across our society and imprison them in order to shut them up, in order to shut up their voices, uh, they're not going to act based upon, I think, any legal motion or an appeal or, you know, at least that's not my... The Bible talks about they acted because they feared the people, and if enough people become aware of the injustices, uh, God can use that, and, uh, and I think maybe... Uh, They'll, they'll start to act when enough outcry comes from the people that the Bible talks about justice falling in the street. And I, I pray that the Lord Jesus uh, picks that justice back up and puts it in the right spot again. But uh, that website, Pastor Wally Drake, is freeshaffercox.com, and that's spelled S-C-H-A-E-F-F-E-R. And we are trying to get his mother. His mother's name is Jennifer, and his uh, daughter's name is Bree, and his son's name is Seth. And he has not seen Bree or Seth in over six years. And so we're trying to raise $3,000 for Schaefer Cox uh, to basically see his children. And, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of things going on that we're trying to do, uh, raise awareness to, you know, make sure that his story is known and educate people about him, his case. But I would say the biggest priority that we have right now is uh, we, want, we want to get his kids, in, 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 kids into that prison visiting system so that he can see them again. It just breaks my heart that he hasn't seen his kids in over six years. And uh, we also can write him letters, and you can get that information from the website, and just write him an encouraging letter. Let him know that he's not forgotten, and let him know that people still care about him. The Bible commands us, you know, forget not your brethren uh, in, in bonds. You know, treat them as the, they, we would want to be treated ourselves. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about him, and uh, we want to just keep, you know, keep shouting the truth. And uh, and I, we've got the ammo. We've, I've got terabytes of information on this case, and uh, we're going to keep putting it out there for anybody who will listen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, go to www.freeshafercox.com. Freeshafercox.com and get that information and pray over it. Use it for two reasons. Number Well, three, really. One is to let you know what's going on. But number two is to motivate you to pray. The Bible says our prayers must be effectual. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person availeth much. And uh, uh, I might not be able to, or Rudy might not be able to tell you exactly how to make them effectual, but we sure know how to make them fervent because we know how to make them hot. And, and we can do that. And uh, so uh, go to that website, check it out, pray with them, pray for them. We're going to continue to do this. We have this prayer conference open 23 hours a week. And so you can communicate uh, with Francis Schaefer Cox that we are praying for him 23 hours a week, and, and we'll continue to do that. 
and we're going to do everything we can uh, to get that, uh, that child named Bree and the child named Seth and the mother, Jennifer, uh, there to visit with this man. What a shame. Every week I have an opportunity to get together with my family. My grandkids and kids are all around me close by, and, and sometimes I get a little uh, nervous because, my goodness, i got to travel and I'm going to be out of town for the week and I don't get a chance to see my kids. And, and I, get, I get nervous when I can't see them every week. And here's a man who's not been with his kids in over five years. What a tragedy in the United States of America, folks. Brother Rudy, be sure and give your wife Erin our greetings and our love. And uh, you guys keep on keeping the work up. Anything else you'd like to share, go ahead. No, uh, that's about it, uh, Pastor Wally Drake. Um, if anybody wants to call me uh, and, 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 and can ask any questions, if you don't mind if I can give my phone number, and I want to just open uh, open that up in case anybody has any questions. We want to, everything is fair game, and we want our goal is to educate and to shine light and make noise, just like Gideon's Army. But my phone number is 972-839-9848. 972-839-9848. Any questions at all? If you uh, if you want to uh, you know ask any questions about Schaefer or you got any ideas about how to uh, educate people about his case or anything at all, please give me a call and uh, we're making it our mission to uh, make noise and shine light and uh, bring this case to the public awareness and to give God all the glory. Just like you said earlier, when Schaefer walks out of that prison and I believe that he will, people are going to ask, "What happened? How did that happen? How in the world?" You know, they expected him to be in prison 26 years. The proper answer is and always will be. Jesus Christ got Schaefer out of that prison. Amen. We're going to give glory to the Lord Jesus Christ every step of the way. Amen. And you know, I, I love that commercial that was made many years ago. Remember when Shake and Bake first came out, uh, there was a mother doing a commercial, and she had a little, beautiful, blonde-headed girl. And they were advertising the ease of the product, shake and bake. You just put the chicken in a sack, throw the stuff in, shake it, then you bake it. They said it was good as fried. Well, I know better, but at least uh, it was a good product, though. And, and on that shake and bake commercial, that little girl at the end, the lady would put the chicken in the bag and put the flour and stuff on it and then shake it and then bake it. And the little girl said, Mama made shake and bake, and I helped. Well, God, through Jesus, is going to make shake and bake in that prison, in our government. And uh, God's going to do it. But I'm going to be able to say with Rudy and the rest of y'all, I helped a little bit. Amen. 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 All right. God bless you, my brother. Thank you for calling. Is there anybody else on the line at this point that would like to ask a question? Rudy Davis is his name, folks, and uh, he's down in Texas, 972-839-9848, and he's a mighty man of God, a mighty prayer warrior, and has a beautiful wife that's a prayer warrior as well. Her name is Erin, and we praise God for them. Keep up the good work, and uh, one of these days we're going to be able to announce on the Wiley Drake Show again, another victory for Jesus and the good guys. Amen. Thank you so much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that was Rudy Davis. And anybody else on the line at this time that would like to chime in with us? And it always helps, Wiley, if you turn the phone on. And uh, we're, that's why Rudy called in on my cell phone, because I didn't turn the phone on. And I apologize for that. If y'all have been trying to get in, I'll turn it on now. And it will be on. Well, for some reason, my phone's not connecting. Well, guess what? I'm going to try to get you out from underneath this. Oh, we're having technical difficulties. Technical oh, absolutely. Details. We're going to get technical about having the difficulties.
why they don't do live broadcasting anymore. Well, it says that I'm connected, but I'm but the music is still on. Yeah. I do not understand. I don't either. Well. But it says I'm connected. I'm so confused. Ladies and gentlemen, while we're trying to figure out the technical uh, Go ahead. aspects of this show, um, is connected. I want to make an observation from what little bit of the material that I've gotten to look in regards to Schaefer Cox's case and give it as a little bit of a warning for uh, those of you that may unfortunately be based or faced with Tonight, there are three participants in the conference. Please announce yourself. Okay, put yours on mute if you would, please, sir. I can do that. All right, are you muted? Yes, sir. Okay, very good. Then we're live on the air now, and we do have our phone system up. Yeah, all right, go ahead. Now, go ahead and give us your little warning that you were giving. One of the few things that I noticed in the history of the Schaefer Cox case as I was going through it that I think certainly the the old Monday morning quarterback issue kicks in but what we now know is as a warning if anybody is faced with a similar problem that Mr. Cox was faced with is as soon as the government agents and he did not know they were government agents he thought they were followers of his constitutional rights position, but as soon as they started bringing up illegal acts, which were clearly entrapment and clearly part of the scam to uh, get him put in prison, but as soon as they said, hey, you need to start talking about uh, shooting federal agents and doing stuff like that, he should have immediately reported that person to the police. And that was the one thing he did incorrectly now that we know about it. And that's, he certainly believed in the First Amendment, certainly felt that people should be able to express their opinion. However, as soon as the government undercover CIs, stands for confidential informants, agents, started talking about killing government employees, that's when he should have gone to the local uh, gendarmes, police, and said, hi, this guy has a problem, you need to talk to him. He's talking about wanting to kill government agents. And it appears to be that that was the main thing they were able to use against him, which is, well, he knew that this guy was trying to talk him into killing somebody, but he didn't say anything about it. And it's what's known, uh, the old crime is called a misprison of a felony, which is 18 United States Code Section 4. And so what they were able to use against poor Mr. Cox was, well, this guy was talking about killing people and you didn't call the cops and tell him that. So I can understand um, why he felt that he should be able to let the guy talk and get a feel for what he was thinking. But as soon as it goes up to the level of killing somebody, man, that's a little bit of a problem. And so if anybody ever suggests to you that you should kill somebody, probably not a bad idea if you report it to the police. Amen. Amen. Well, and we know, though, that the government is very slick in using those scenarios, if you will. And let me give you, uh, I, I'm not an expert in this, but I do have a little bit of experience. Do we have somebody on the line? Hello? Hello, are you there? You don't have to identify yourself, but we would ask you to lead us in prayer or share a thought or a question or whatever you have, just so we know you're alive. All right, well, we're going to proceed ahead. I, I talked just a moment ago about a... This is me, Justin. Who is this? I'm David Myers. Okay, well, go ahead and mute if you would, David. Uh, but before you mute, would you lead us in prayer? Lead us in prayer, please. Oh, sir. Father God, I come to you right now in the name of Jesus Christ. And I just lift this day up to you, Father God. I lift this church and the pastor and all of us up to you, Father God, as we're 
closer to the end times, I just ask for your guidance and your strength to be within us all, and that we just look up to you more, Father God, and when we get down and out and stressed, that we just remember that you're in charge and that nobody else can hold the camel to you, Father, and I just ask for more strength and guidance for myself and to get it together so I can help those in, in need too. And I just uh, thank you for this day. I thank you for all your blessings. And I just set everything up to you in the mighty name of Jesus, the precious and holy son. Amen. 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 All right, David Myers, thank you so much. And mute that phone if you would so we don't get feedback. And ladies and gentlemen, I was talking about a scenario that we need to pray about. Uh, in times past, I have been personally involved in those scenarios. I was not arrested. I was not put in jail. But the scenario they dreamed up on me was uh, I prayed a special prayer for the President of the United States, uh, Barry Satoro. Now, y'all know him as Barack Hussein Obama, but I've seen his birth certificate, and I know who he really is. Now, I prayed this prayer for the President. Not my words, but God's words. Hold not thy peace, O God, of my praise. The mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful are open against me. They've spoken against me with a lying tongue. And then I went on to pray, and it says, Set thou a wicked man over him. Let Satan stand at his right hand. When he shall be judged, let him be condemned. And then the Bible says, not widely, but the Bible says, Let his days be few. On Hannity and Combs, Mr. Combs said, if you pray, let his days be few, that means you're praying for the death of the president. And I said, yes, and then that's when they cut me off. Because I said, yes, but it's not my words that are calling for death, it is God's word. But they left that on the cutting room floor. They didn't put that out. And another thing is, they had to justify making a trip all the way to California. And so uh, they sent Secret Service people out here to knock on my door. And a part of the justification was, is that they, someone had asked me about the fact of what I thought about uh, having possession of a firearm. And what I would do and how I would respond if they were to take my legal, God-given right to possess a firearm, if they tried to take it away from me, what would I do? And they tried to back me in a corner. Well, this time I was a little bit smarter, but here's what I said. If they want to take my gun away from me that I have legally, and it is from a gift from God, uh, I simply am going to claim the Charlton Heston of defense. Mr. Heston said before he went to heaven, the only way they're ever going to get my gun is after they pry my cold dead fingers from around the stock. So uh, they used that against me uh, because I was threatening the president or I was threatening to shoot people. No, they lied. They twisted my words. And that's exactly what they did with Francis Schaeffer Cox. And they twisted his words, and they ended up getting a judge to agree that his words were, quote, dangerous. And by the way, we have a dear friend of mine. I was told back in 2014 uh, that a dear friend of mine out in Nevada was being challenged by the government. And uh, the government came in and said, you're a rancher here in Bunkerville but you can't use the water on your ranch. And Mr. Cliven Bundy said, hey, that's my ranch, that's my water, that's my cows. You can't tell me what to do with it or how to do it. And so he did it, and now he's in jail, been in jail now for months, solitary confinement, mistreated, and so forth, along with almost 20 other men who did the same thing. And the... Uh, Folks up in Oregon, the father, uh, Brother Eugene and Brother Stephen, were working with the government to do what they call a controlled burn. Controlled burn is where they 
uh, set fire to the grass and the underbrush to take care of the overgrowth. And uh, they did that, and one of the little fires got out of hand, and it caused a couple hundred dollars worth of damage on government property. And they charged those men with arson. And they put them in jail for about two and a half to three years. And then, after they were in jail, they let them out. And then they decided, no, they wanted to put them back in jail because they were not only arsonists, but they were terrorist arsonists because they had been in support of Clive and Bundy and because they had been in support of the legal right to keep and bear arms, which is what God gave us. God gave us that freedom. The Constitution just helps protect it, at least sometimes. And so that's how they twist things. That's how they do things. And the final twist in all of this was a dear, dear friend of mine from out there with Cliven, a guy by the name of LaBoy Finnecum, uh, said those guys are going up to Oregon to take a stand uh, for the, the uh, uh, family that was in jail and to try to get them out of jail. And they went up there and they went into a building that they said belonged to the government. It didn't. It was public property. And they gave them the keys to get in. And they went in there and was in that building, but the government made it sound like they had taken over a building and were holding it hostage. Nothing could be farther from the truth. LaVoy Finnecum is a, was a godly man and was there to try to help negotiate and had, had held several meetings uh, with the sheriff and with the police and tried to work the thing out. And on one day back in the first part of January, uh, he was there and they were asked by the government to go to this certain place to meet with them. And on the way, the government, the government ambushed them on the highway and began shooting at their vehicle. LaVoy Finnecum got out of the vehicle and said, please don't shoot, I don't have a gun, and please don't shoot, there's women in, in this truck, please don't shoot, if you got to shoot somebody, shoot me. And if you want to go to the video, you can see that, and uh, they indeed took him at his word because they did indeed shoot LaVoy Finnecum nine times, killing him. They said he was reaching in his left side to get a weapon. First of all, he didn't have a weapon. They produced a weapon that said was on his person, and it turned out it was a weapon that had been stolen five years before. That's the record of the weapon. Why would a ranger, I mean a rancher, have a stolen gun? Well, the other thing is, he was not left-handed. He was right-handed, and he would have had his weapon, if he'd have had one, on his right side. But his right hand going to his left side wasn't to get a weapon. It was to grab his side where he had been shot. And they let him lay there on the ground for more than 15 minutes before they even checked to see if he was alive or dead. They didn't get paramedics. They didn't do nothing. All they did was set him up for an ambush, shoot him nine times, and plant a gun on him. That's what really happened. And those other men are still in jail because of that scenario. These scenarios are getting out of hand, folks and we need to stand up against them, and we will continue to fight. There are other things that have happened today that we need to talk about because right. the future of America is going to be based on it. Two unbelievably interesting things have happened um, within 24 hours of each other, and if you have anybody who thinks that voting for Hillary is a really good idea, mm -hmm. then you need to grab them by the scruff of the neck, drag them to uh, the Internet, and have them look at two things. The first is a book written by a gentleman by the name of Gary Byrne, B-R-Y-N-E. He was a Secret Service agent guarding the Clintons while they were in the White House. And he has now put out a book. And it tells what sort of nasty, evil people the Clintons really are. And surprisingly... Hillary is much worse than Bill is. Yep. Bill is a philanderer. He certainly likes chasing the skirts. But it is Hillary 
who is the actual evil one. She is the one that uh, saw with a deadly weapon on Bill when she threw a vase at him, blacked his eye, broke the vase in the White House, no less. We know that she tried to steal $200,000 worth of furniture and collectibles out of the White House when they left. Um, we also know that she's very good at lying. That leads us into the second thing that has happened. The second thing that has happened is the Congressional Committee on Benghazi has finally released their report. And to no great surprise to everybody, the Democrats are saying, oh, well, it proves that she's absolutely innocent. She did nothing wrong. Just the opposite. What it proves is that she did nothing to save those men's lives. She allowed them to die. She had a duty as the Secretary of State to protect her staff members, including an ambassador, the ambassadors work for the Secretary of State, and she just stood back and let them die. They were under attack while she was at a meeting trying to decide how to best to sell this to the news media um, while it was ongoing. The question that didn't get answered yet, and I'm looking forward to the pundits to start talking about it, is why in the world would the Secretary of State have the power to tell the military to stand down? Two different branches of the government, she shouldn't have that power, right. and yet it appears that would be exactly what she did. Well, we know that uh, with Gary Burns' book, <coughs> there's going to be a lot of information <coughs> coming out. And by the way, Gary, I don't know you. I met you one time in Arkansas when Bill was running for governor of Arkansas. And uh, you're welcome to come on this show. You're welcome to come on the show with or without your book. I'd like to have a copy of it. But you're welcome to come on this show and tell us anything you'd like to tell us about the book. I have not read the book. I will read the book. And I will find out more about it. I will put my investigation mind on it and investigate and see what we can do. The Benghazi situation, I've already done that. About four years ago, I began to investigate the Benghazi situation. Two and a half years, well, actually three years ago, the government contacted me about the possibility of what they were going to do with Nakula Basila Nakula, who wrote the movie, Innocence, of Islam, and that movie, Hillary said, that's why those four Americans were killed, because the people were mad about the movie. And Mr. Obama said the same thing. And then later, they both admitted that they lied. Now, they didn't say we lied. They said we were mistaken. They said it wasn't the movie that caused the killing. It was Al-Qaeda and Hamas and so forth. They finally told the truth. But Mr. Nakula Basila Nakula was still in prison and was left in prison. And finally they let him out and back two and a half years ago they released him to our custody here at the First Southern Baptist Church and Fellowship, Messianic Fellowship and Sanctuary. And he is still a resident here. And if you would like to interview him or talk to him, all you got to do is call me. I'll set it up. My phone number is 714-865-8132. Give me a call. We'll be glad to set that up for you. One of the good things about the report is that the report clearly clears. There's a double entendre. Mr. Nakula, because it clearly states that that video had absolutely positively nothing to do with Benghazi. And so what we know is, and it's amazing how Hillary says, oh, well, it's all over, you guys can forget everything, let's move on now. No, Hillary, it proved that you lied to the family, you lied to the press, you lied to other people. You are a liar, Hillary Clinton, and I do not want a liar like you to be President of the United States. The only place you need to become a residence of is the Gray Bar Hotel, not the White House. Yes. And ladies and gentlemen, in order to let you know that we are not just talking about it, 
I have in front of me signed by me an affidavit to the United States Department of State, i.e., Thunder Thigh Hillary. And we have sent to them a record slash information dissemination section. We've sent it there to Westminster, Virginia. And this is a request by me. These are the following items I am requesting under number 5 U.S.C. 552 et al. All pre-attack requests made by Ambassador Stevens, all responses to Ambassador Stevens, who first offered the video, Innocence of Muslims, as the explanation of Benghazi. I want to know who offered that. And the death of four Americans. I want all emails sent and received by Thunder Thigh Hillary relating to the Benghazi event, which resulted in the death of four Americans. All correspondence I'm requesting under the Freedom of Information Act, radio transcripts, orders between Secretary of State personnel and any other United States military, Correspondence, transcripts, agreements, etc., etc. All orders, any writings, transcripts of any and all meetings relating to Hillary Clinton or any member of her staff and the Benghazi attack. Ladies and gentlemen, Benghazi was attacked by Al Qaeda and Hamas. And Bill and others talked about it. But Hillary said, oh, it was because of that movie. And Obama said it was because of the movie. And nothing could be farther from the truth. For those of you that didn't see our show yesterday, what we need to bring you up to speed on is th this is the perfect example of something that's absolutely correct, and the government hates it like you can't believe, which is the Freedom of Information Act request statute. For those of you that are interested in running a little bit of an a Internet check on it, it is... Title V, United States Code, Section 552. We are a representative democracy. We are protected by a constitution. We, the people, That's right. are the most powerful entity in the United States. We, the people. Not the President of the United States. Not the uh, eight people sitting in the black robes in a little building up in Washington. Not all of those people sitting in the Capitol. We the people is where the authority starts, and then it flows down to them. As a result of being we the people, we have the right to know what our government is doing. And fortunately, the Freedom of Information Act was passed because we had a history of elected officials not wanting us to know what the government was doing. So by sending this demand to the government, Pastor Drake has literally told them, put up or shut up about this. They are going to have to respond to it. Now, does that mean he's going to have a truck pull up and a bunch of documents thrown out onto the parking lot? Probably not. They're <laughs> probably going to fight tooth and nail to keep from releasing this stuff. But it's going to cause them a problem in light of the fact that the Benghazi Committee has now released its report, which means there is no current ongoing investigation, and they certainly have released the result of that, so they're not going to be able to use as an excuse that they're, oh, well, there's an ongoing investigation, so we don't have to release it. According to Hillary Clinton today, Benghazi is now over, and we should move on. Well, then there must not be any current and ongoing investigation. So why don't you give us the documents so we can put them on this show and let we, the people, decide if, in fact, Hillary, you're a liar and an accessory to the murder of four Americans in Benghazi. Mrs. Clinton... You have Wiley Drake's personal invitation to be on this television program. You can come to us here in Buena Park, or I'll come to you. Wherever you're at, I'll come to you. We'll do it live. We will not cut anything out. We will not leave anything out. Whatever you say, we will put on the air 100%. We'll not leave anything out like you used to do in Arkansas and like you used to do in the White House. We will have you on, and we'll ask you questions, but we'll give you a chance to answer, and we'll give you a chance to defend yourself. And lacking that, we know 
uh, you're afraid to be on this show. Something I change the subject here, ladies and gentlemen. As you know, there are certain issues that are ongoing that uh, we are very dedicated to trying to make a change with them. Um, one of them, unfortunately, we had to talk about yesterday because the Supreme Court did not um, grant a hearing on the abortion case out of Texas where Texas was trying to give a little bit better medical protection for women that were thinking about undergoing that procedure. And unfortunately, the Supremes decided that, nah, we're not going to give the women the protection that they need um, because that might hurt their feelings. Somebody has sent me, and you'll notice that I'm on the computer, that's because I'm looking at social media and tracking what's being done with this show while I'm on social media. One of the advantages of being a live show, we actually get to see things happen as we put it out over the air. This is one of these things that I have to admit that I experienced and I had not made the connection. And I do love connecting the dots. I was a Vietnam-era veteran. The gentleman sitting next to me was a Vietnam veteran and actually went to Vietnam not once but twice. So he was a Vietnam veteran. For those of you that uh, may just been a gleam in daddy's eye back when the Vietnam was ongoing, um, I remember where it was very common for the young social democrats to call us veterans, military men, <coughs> baby killers. We would come back, if we were in uniform, they'd spit on us, and they would call us baby killers. Okay, so what you're saying is that we were really bad guys, and we were over in Vietnam, and we were killing children. Okay, can somebody explain to me why the same democratic, socialist, liberals are saying that abortion is okay when they are killing babies? Isn't that kind of a little bit of a problem? that they accuse us veterans of being baby killers, but when in fact they kill millions of babies by way of an abortion, that does create an interesting problem. All right, Mr. Davis, any last remarks? Otherwise, we're going to stop the show at this point. Is there anybody on the uh, television line or telephone line that wishes to say anything before we uh, call it quits for the day? Going once, going twice. Ladies and gentlemen, you have our prayers and our happiness for you. We thank you for listening to the show. We look forward to getting your responses in, both on our Facebook page, Stephen Davis, or on the Wiley Drake Facebook page, or the Wiley Drake for President Facebook page. Amen. So by all means, the more we hear from you, the better we can serve you. In Jesus Christ's name, I wish you a good day. Amen.